Welcome to the 40th edition of AirHex TV. But who cares about the 40th edition, right? Uh, 42, we should celebrate, or I mean, 40th is just a usual number. So um, let's start with the topics. And um, yeah, you have watched me. I should not say whatever. So I'm really careful with that. And uh, yeah, start with the uh, first question. Whether I rec recommend using JustPeak uh, for securing Java 7 web apps. And um, JustPeak is uh, really powerful. Um, the problem with, um, with JustPeak is um, it's powerful and complex. And uh, I think there is a nice alternative. So what uh, David uh, said, um, I want to avoid unnecessary dependencies on third-party libraries as much as possible. So how to avoid third-party libraries the best? is, um, of course, uh, with standards. And there is one standard on the horizon. It's called uh, JSR375. It's the Java E Security API. And uh, you can already download the PDF. So if you go to jcp.org and you download and you search for 375, then you will find uh, the Java Security API. And uh, you can download it from, uh, at, yeah, this is fairly new. And the nice thing about um, the security API is um, it wraps the JASPIC and provides a lot easier injectable with CDI injectable. Um, I think it's called HTTP authentication module. And uh, yeah, it's way easier to use. And it already works um, on Java 7 servers. In fact, what I did, uh, I think one year ago, I used the reference implementation called Zotaria and, uh, and tested that on, um, I think Glassfish and Payara um, and Whitefly on this service. So um, I would um, so back to the to the answer. Um, I would really uh, at least at least look at JSR three seven five. If you cannot use it right now for very, I, I don't know any reason why why not to use it because it will run on Java seven servers. And the cool story is, you can then uh, if you if you upgrade to Java eight, you can just remove the Zotaria and it will part of the application server. This would be my way. Okay, um, so we have some uh, also some news and topics, and um, what um, I participated in a few conferences. I was um, I think only on the InfoShare conference. And yeah, only it's a huge conference, and um, and delivered a uh, workshop uh, about microservices. And the funny story is, last year I also delivered a microservice workshop, but I got so many questions, so um, I couldn't even write a single line of code, I think. And some attendees were disappointed. So this year I didn't allow any questions, and I just hacked the whole time. And we achieved a lot, so we deployed micro communicated microservices. But after the workshop, developers came to me and ask me uh, how I test Java 7 applications, Java 8 applications, or Java 6 applications, and what about uh, embedded container testing? And I thought um, this is already discussed the topic, and I got similar questions over and over again. And they were surprised that I'm not using uh, embedded containers that much. So I usually rely on uh, straight unit tests, integration tests, which boots parts of the application server. And by the way, the attendees of the um, AirHex testing virtual were also very surprised that it's actually possible to boot various parts of the application server, like um, JPA container, without uh, Delta Spike, without Archelian, without anything. And, um, and um, um, yeah, there's, of course, an online Java 7 course, or watch my, my, my YouTube videos or, or my blog. So my approach to Java 7 testing, there's actually no difference to Pojo's. So I test the uh, business logic with JUnit straight and Mokito. And uh, integration tests are, uh, it's just is persistence, create entity manager, factoring, create entity manager. This is the usual way to go. And uh, the same with uh, bin validation. And uh, I use Archelian, Delta Spike, or CDI unit. Only in cases where, um, where I heavily depend on uh, on the business logic of the um, or business logic of the capabilities of the application server, for instance, um, there is one library called Porcupine, which um, is uh, means the same as Hystrix. <laughs> and uh, the Porcupine library, if you if you clone the code, it is exclusively tested with Archelian because there is no other way to test it because um, it heavily depends on the application server. The whole point is injection of, of um, thread pools. So um, in, in 
but this is the exception from the rule. In my business project, there is no Archelian. In my technical project, lots of Archelian. Okay, so uh, this was uh, a side note. And uh, on, on air hacks, so the, uh, the classic air hacks are over. So there was a bootstrap effective and testing this time. So I wanted to introduce a variation. So instead of architecture, just testing went well. Actually, uh, some attendees, as, the, as they heard that, that there's going to be a testing workshop, they uh, spontaneously registered to the testing workshop. And um, uh, what, what was funny, uh, we developed and tested the whole day a um, Java 7 app and tested that. And then the last, last I would say, one hour, um, we we implemented a Jenkins 2.0 pipeline and f and deployed it to um, to, uh, to to and release it um, to Docker registry, and um, and yeah, there will be no classic workshops this year. There will be just uh, the web stuff. And by the way, if you can attend web standards, so I will try to ditch as many web frameworks as possible, and. Um, and of course, in December, there will be architecture, microservices, and lots of fun performance troubleshooting and, and monitoring. And some of the questions is, are going to be addressed as well here. OK, um, then what I did today night. So today night, um, I did something with, I played around with Payara again. And um, why? Because um, several uh, ver releases of uh, of 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 uh, Payara, what happened then? They um, they removed the auto deployment because of security reasons. And if you um, remove the auto deployment feature in Payara, you cannot easily use it in. Also, you can use it in Docker, of course, but not very easily. What I usually do, I just copy the thin war to the auto deploy in Payara, deployed it for me as Whitefly and Tommy did. But hence, there is no. Uh, no auto deploy. The um, the script would be more complicated and not that conventional. So what um, I think since two three hours, what I did, I uh, I rewrote the uh, Docker file. This is the Docklands project. So if you go to GitHub, not Procupine, rather than Docklands, you will find a new Payara and Payara Derby images. So Payara, where is it? Payara with Derby and Payara straight, you see eight hours ago. And there is a Docker file. And um, so there is some variation and, and what happened there. What I'm using is actually a really nice Payara feature. It's called post command. And um, what happens here, I'm, I'm uh, deploying a file. So I'm, this is actually the whole whole story here, I'm deploying uh, the first file from the deployment there and generating the deployment command and then the um, as admin start domain verbose and this post boot command, um, deploy command, this post boot command is a new in Payara, um, I think 171 um, and the deploy uh, command is the, um, is the file here. And uh, I got the idea from a Payara engineer, he filed a, uh, a pull request forgot his name, um, really nice guy. And what I did, just did and optimized that because what I wanted to have is you no know, conventional behavior. There should be only one war in the auto deploy. It should be picked and deployed. And there was one of the um, of the questions from the past um, AirHex TV. So um, I wanted to say that problem is solved. And um, the other problem I found is that actually Derby, all the Derby versions do not work well on Docker. And what you get, you get strange errors like uh, class cast runtime exception, which comes from commons file utils. And um, what I found out is that if you upgrade Derby, so this is um, what I did. I downloaded just the recent version of, uh, of Derby and unzip that, remove that. And uh, so I basically replaced the within Payara the uh, older Derby, which was 10.0 something, was 10.10, 10, 10, 10, was 10.12. And it works. So drop in replacement just works. So you have, if you would like to use for testing reasons, um, I wanted to say whatever right now. For testing reasons, um, a derby with Payara, you can just use this, and um, and all the images already pushed to Docker Hub. So you can just use um, as usual airhex slash Payara with derby or uh, airhex slash Payara. And there was one question in the online microservices course and uh, the attendees complained that uh, Payara does not work anymore and the issue was I upgraded the image 
with the recent Payara, but uh, the auto deployment didn't work. So this is solved. And uh, some drama on the internet. Oh, let's see whether there are any questions. No questions, no questions. Uh, yeah, the Pavel, the Pavel uh, was on the highway, but he made, um, but he made right now <laughs> to watch me um, watch us online. So chat is lazy. So I'm hopefully I'm in the right channel. So just three attendees. So usually there are no from all over the world. I don't know what happens. Probably the weather is too good. Um, so what was the next one? Hey, uh, drama. So. I was at, um, so this was actually nice, the InfoShare conference. So I delivered two talks. This is um, Competitive advantage, advantage for Startups. This was half an hour talk. And the other one, I forgot the title, was something about why Java is also interesting for enterprises. So um, I wanted to actually to show why it's interesting, some features which make it interesting for startups and other features which makes it interesting for for enterprises. And I mean, no wonder uh, the Java is out. My, my opinion everywhere so and lots of huge companies what's um is is not that known um I'm not, the known is also very appreciated by startups at least so getting things done startups and um and i just gathered my experiences and presented a talk and the cool story is i mean the info shares is a huge startup area so i really expected some drawback but it was well received but what happened afterwards uh, i got a comment like smells like a little kettle farm um and trust me, Java is waste for, of time for startups and for enterprises for that matter. And um, it's okay. So I answered that actually this this was based on some interviews. And my, if my clients are happy, there is no reason to move away from Java. -y. And um, and then the discussion just exploded on, on Twitter. And my suggestion was, um, so I, I, I would say this in general, this is a, this is a good idea. What Ashton on, on, or someone else could do is just record a half an hour, not talk, if you have time, just screencast to show the alternative. So what you could do, for instance, I could show, you know, how easy it is to start or, uh, or do some interesting things with Java. Actually, I did it on my YouTube channel a lot. And someone else could show the alternatives. Like, okay, let's say uh, Java E is too complicated. I would just use Java SE, which was actually a suggestion here, because... Um, yeah, uh, Ashton uh, proposes to use basic collection instead of ORM. So how the approach would look like there? And I mean, this would be really interesting, be a constructive discussion. And this really exploded. So actually, I got so many tweets, and tweets is really terrible to discuss things. So um, my uh, my answer was, um, yeah, my client just like it. So if, and if developers like it, I mean, then everyone is happy. Okay. So drama on the internet. So and um, uh, in case the other talk is going to be released, I will also publish it as well on my blog. And uh, next um, uh, topic or topic, um, there is a for forgotten talk by accident uh, answering this talk. I saw um, there's actually one um, Java One 2015 talks unorthodox um, enterprise practices. And I just watched briefly what I did. As I never watched my f talk of my fully, but I just uh, s skipped through through the through the um, through the slides. And um, I also presented some some ideas here. I guess even BCE. So um, if you if you're interested in this, um, I just expose that. It's called Unorthodox Enterprise Practices. It is a two years old uh, talk, but it still still works. I see. Um, old talk because I use my old laptop here so cool and uh, on that note what's also happened so this is the info share talk um, as I told uh, told you the last time um, I participated in Oracle code conference it uh, there is an Oracle in the name but it's a really nice conference and uh, with Bruno Borges with lots of fun and Stephen Chin and um, what, what I plan to do is, because it's Oracle, it's like at least what I should do, I should use the um, Oracle infrastructure. And I was su surprised about the Oracle container service in, in a cloud service in Docker. And as I promised, I recorded as a short, um, a short uh, screencast. And, and, and what, is, what it shows is 
how to create a Java e application from scratch and push it to Oracle Cloud. I did the same with um, Amazon Web Services and it was Jelastic. But um, what's, what's, what's nice of Oracle Container Service, you can actually create your own uh, private registry and push it to your own private registry, uh, one registry for the whole cloud. In Amazon, you will, uh, um, how it's meant in Amazon uh, Web Services, you have one repository per service. So you will have to deploy your container or uh, application server twice or, or, or three times per service. No, sorry, once per service. And in, in the case of Oracle Container Cloud Service, you can have one base image and reuse it across all images, which make it um, extremely, extremely fast. So um, just if, if you like to, to see how it works, just, just take a look at this. I think it is about yeah seven minutes with uh, creation, build, and deployment. And you can see me twice, so I have a twin. <laughs> okay, so, um, and uh, of course, where is it? There was an interview, I forgot to publish that, so I will do this. And uh, with Elda from Brazil, there's this is a Java and Java E uh, enthusiast, as I am. Stop that. And this is uh, the future of Java E. And this was a nice conversation. Uh, this is Elda Moraes for So Java, and uh, he wanted to interview me. It, it worked well. Uh, usually, uh, Google Hangout, we had some troubles uh, with uh, Risa interviewed uh, two years ago, but this worked really well. And at the end, I even asked some question Elda, and this people liked it. So if you liked, take a look. Um, this was a nice conversation, and Elda is a really nice guy. And if you're doing something um, about Java E. I'm pretty sure Edda would like also to interview you. So um, just ping him and you get an interview. Hopefully it's, it's meant that, that way. Okay. So I think all the, yeah, we covered all the uh, collateral topics. Now focus on content again. And I got um, a, uh, a question on my YouTube channel and wanted to discuss it here. Uh, actually on the Oracle Container Cloud service. What do you think about Lambdas and the move from Oracle to evolve Java, including more functional programming style features? And uh, as, as I read that, I thought, okay, this is Oracle Container Cloud service. And I thought it is meant um, AWS Lambdas. And, um, and then I got, it's actually not about the cloud rather than about, uh, about Java itself, Java SE. But I will answer it twice, first regarding the cloud and, and second regarding Java SE. And um, I have to say, I, uh, strange with me. So I, I, uh, I always, I only used, I, th I used, uh, I started with Basic, then Turbo Pascal, then C and C plus plus, then Java and JavaScript at the same time, uh, or LiveScript, JavaScript. This was, uh, I think, uh, the first books were even with the name LiveScript, and uh, and now I stick with uh, JavaScript and Java. But for me. The lambdas came natural if I work with them. I saw lambdas, I think, two years before they came at Java 1 and various conferences. And just from the slides, it, it looked terrible for me. So, But if I use, since I use lambdas and method references, I, I really like them. And uh, they are readable for me, and I really like to write them. So, um, And I think... I'm not the only Java developer because what I observe in projects, in Java immigration projects, if the developer get chance to use lambdas, they just use it and the code looks reasonable so far. So I think it was a good move. And um, what I really don't like is like move from the move from Oracle to Evolve. It's not like Oracle is moving. Uh, what uh, what you have to know is um, there are the Sun engineers, you know, with some smart Oracle engineers together. So I mean the previous Sun engineers working at Oracle right now. And there are also Oracle engineers working with the Sun engineers together. So everything is Oracle right now. And um, what I what they are thinking is, you know, how to move forward Java. And this is their job, and they 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 they, they do a really great job. And um, Oracle sounds like uh, you know Oracle management would like to make Java functional, which I don't think is true at all. Um, There's like engineers do the work, and uh, so far I really like it. Yeah. And. Um, and I use lambdas in projects, and I also use uh, lambda in particular in Java E, and I even use ja um, lambdas in the uh, in the AirHex uh, workshops at Munich. So the whole time, actually, when I can, I use lambdas. What is the alternative? I mean, you could use uh, inner classes. I didn't like the inner classes. I tried to avoid them. 
And speaking of uh, Amazon AWS lambdas, so you can also do this. So what it means is you will you will deploy a function as a service. So it would be a Java method, setting method, or yeah, something like a lambda. And uh, you um, and this is a cloud service which is not like the server runs all the time. Uh, it's like more like your service wakes up and then goes to sleep, and you just pay per invocation. And um, I mean, I'm pretty neutral with that. This is a somehow related with serverless. This is more about business model. So if you are starting a business, let's say you have a printing service and you would like to print something in the cloud or, or convert something or encrypt, uh, compress, um, encode, then lambdas are nice because if someone invokes the lambda, you pay it. If no one invokes the service, you are not paying this. But um, I have to say, for instance, um, my uh, the 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 Airhex I/O could be implemented like uh, as a Lambda service. If someone buys the the uh, Airhex I/O workshops, they they would download the workshop and then the Lambda function uh, would uh, wake up and do something and then go to sleep. Um, but it's not very suitable for this because I usually get timeout of ten minutes. But it could be. I mean, if there will be no timeout, it will be one one um, sample where where it would work well. So from the business model perspective, it could work. But what I'm thinking is, um, I never saw a startup where you can, you know, have uh, one invocation per hour. So usually, what happens if you if you get one, two, three requests per second, it does not matter anymore, because then you are paying per invocations, and then as a running service, um, uh, running service would be not very expensive. So I think I forgot what, uh, my applications. Application server cluster on um, Amazon Web Services, and I paid I think 30 euros per month. Um, so I think it's 30 euros per month is not a lot of money if you're running, you know, application servers all the time. And uh, if you have a startups, I mean, the question is what you will save. This is what interests me. And I uh, read some articles where they say you can save, you know, um, I don't know, 70 euros per month. Uh, but I, I'm not. The question is, is it a lot, right? So, this is also an air hacker. So, nice guy. He attended uh, air hacks, I think the monitoring workshop. And what are your strategies to reduce the compiled size of React.js application? So, uh, <laughs> what he says is, um, it is a bigger than the uh, Java UR, which is very true. So, two and a half uh, megabyte uh, was actually two, uh, are already two and a half Java microservices, usually, a huge microservices. Uh, huge thin wars, and um, what you can do? Well, uh, he refers to JarJS. This is what I used in the HTML5 workshop, and my code was not optimized at all. Um, I'm not even sure whether it was minified. But um, if it if it if it were, what you can do? Um, the code is transpiled. What transpiled means is uh, it is translated from from ES6 to ES5. One thing you can do is just to activate these. How it's called plugins, uh, Babel plugins, which are actually in use, uh, and then you can reduce the size because ES6 is very lean, and ES the translation to ES5 is actually huge. So um, what you could even try if this is an uh, intranet app, if you have a Chrome um, a browser, it would uh, or Chrome on Edge, it could even run without any any transpilations. And uh, and if you need some polyfills, just use this. This would be one thing. And there are two nice um, uh, alternatives, which sometimes you have to use them anyway. Preact.js, which is like alternative uh, to uh, to React, but but it's, but it's smaller. And the other one is called Inferno.js, which comes with uh, here is it, which is also smaller. And sometimes you have to use the alternatives because uh, there are some license issues, um, uh, small issues, just search for React license, you will find the issues. Uh, it's not a huge issue, but there is uh, some, no, not everything is clear with uh, with the React, React licensing. Okay, hope is done. And um, so, Niksha, and it's interesting, today is uh, a lot of stuff about security. So what Niksha did, and this is actually a really nice um, repo, so I take, took a look at the code. He actually implemented um, a uh, servlet login module very smartly. This is container servlet filter, and he used HTTP uh, servlet uh, request wrapper and exposed the uh, principle and roles. So if you go here to the, uh, where is it? Yeah, 
this is uh, the repository so you should start the repository of course so uh, but uh, <laughs> this was nice you see remove JUnit so this it means is real world app <laughs> Uh, in real world, you said not remove JUnit rather than increase code coverage, removed asserts. This would be real world. Um, so, auth request filter, everything starts with that. And, and what he did, um, he just uses uh, the, um, uh, yeah, he has to cast request responses, okay. And then he use, he implemented auth request wrapper. And then he's able to, to, uh, to expose own principal remote user and is user in role. And um, then he has an own custom principle, which can be also used. And uh, there is a login servlet, which uh, and probably what he can do. Yeah, he um, he sets the user my custom principle. This is I don't get why he did it because usually you will get the principle through the um, it will be injectable actually. And um, yeah, this this works of course. Um, but um, if you if you are that involved, what you should take a look at Keycloak, for instance. Keycloak has comes with, serv uh, with similar uh, servlet filters, um, or take a look at Soteria. And I I am pretty sure there is some in some of my screencasts on my blog. Wait a second. Principal principal injection. Perfect. Four years ago, I recorded a screencast. Uh, so it looks strange, but it was four years ago. And um, what I did, I extended the custom principle without a servlet. So um, if you have some time, just look at this. And uh, this could be also interesting to you. So um, this is a, a way of, of extending the um, custom principle by reading additional stuff from a database. It's just a simple producers, but this also so solves some problems. Okay, so your idea, of course, works great. So, I mean, it will work, um, no downsides. I'll, I will still take a look at GSR 375 because it well integrates with servlets already. And um, if you need some more power, so take a look at Keycloak or OpenAM. OpenAM from ForgeRock. So we had it several times already. ForgeRock. Or, of course, Keycloak. Keycloak. Org. Both. Okay. So, next one. So, um, I had a quiz screencast about Thin Wars and Docker. The question is how to how to handle database transactions. So it's not about uh, microservice transactions rather than database transactions. Um, so the, the best practices of using Docker in one is one image, one responsibility. So I need two images for application and the database. This is, this is not necessarily true. So um, I, I, I implemented several microservices and they use JPA to talk to a database. Nothing wrong with that. What could happen that uh, you don't have a relational database. So you have, for instance, Elasticsearch, then you would have a REST service with CRUD, or you can wrap your relational database with a microservice, but you don't have to. So, um, and best practice, all, if I hear best practice, I always ask myself for what? Uh, what do you gain with this best practice? So, um, of course, you can could potentially replace the database and this would mean this microservice is something like a DAO on steroids. Uh, could be interesting, but doesn't have to. So um, I would start by implementing a microservice, one team per microservice, and I, ha I would have no problems if you talk straight to the database. So you don't have to wrap the database again. And then there's no problem with, with uh, database transactions. And if you have to wrap the database, then it's still no problem because uh, the microservices could be idempotent. For instance, if you perform put, you have the key. Um, you can, you know, um, you can uh, as long try to to save something until it happens. And if it happens twice, the first would be the insert. The next one would be the update. The only problem is, uh, of course, post um, because um, yeah, it is not idempotent, but you can construct something. Take a look at non. 
Nuns. Nuns uh, rest. Okay, forgot rest, just nuns. Yeah, uh, nuns uh, means a um, random number. <laughs> so what you could do, you can create a nuns or random number, um, attach it to the to the request, and the server would remember this this number, and if it happens again, or if it occurs again, it will just drop the request. So something like this could work. Okay. Next one. Do you recommend using GSF prime faces in the whole front-end application? Um, so I, I would not, so yes, of course. I mean, um, my approach is always go to, if you if you, if you you would like, is the following. We I think we had it several times. Go to prime faces. <laughs> prime face is not there yet, but prime faces.org. And there are demos, so go to the demos. And what I do, I present the demos to the users. And if they are happy with the components, you can use it, but they should sign off, you know, a paper which says, okay, use them as they are, no extensions. Then just use it. This would be most probably the most productive framework ever. Um, any substantial modification of the components can be very expensive. It means it could take a long, and the problem is take a long time. The problem is, of course, if prime faces evolves, uh, you, you will sit on your fork effectively, and uh, then what you will do. Um, so, of course, um, I, 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 I absolutely could imagine. So I was in a project where everyone was happy with prime faces. So it's not, 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 nothing wrong with that. And mixing with React could be problematic. Because uh, what it actually means is uh, what you could do, you could create a GSF custom component, which is a whole React app. And what I also don't get, React, Angular, or even HTML5. So Angular and React is HTML5. So what I could imagine is you could absolute mix prime faces with HTML5. This is this is this is usual, very usual. Mixing React and Angular with JSF is uh, unusual. Why? Because uh, React and Angular they have they manage the state on the client, not on the server, and they have so-called uh, virtual DOM, which is another state layer, and JSF manages state on the server. So if you really know what you are doing, you could of course mix and match React, Angular, and JSF. But it could be hell on earth, become <laughs> hell on earth. Mixing prime faces with HTML5 is just normal. Uh, yeah, and I'm working on a nice course about HTML5, but not about prime faces. So, um, so can we rely on RESTful web services to communicate between the modules? Of course, absolutely. And I think there's, of course, a screencast. Uh, communication. Microservices. Yeah. So take a look at this Java E microservice communication, and this is I implemented this in 13 minutes with lots of talking and explanation. Usually it is faster. So absolutely you can do this. Oh. Oh man. I closed the important tab. Okay, now let's see what happens here. So there's almost no one in the chat. Just me, twice. What happens here? Ah, uh, um, the um, Andy, what Andy also did, um, he uh, posted me uh, something interesting. Let's see, there will be an uh, here. This is a very uh, interesting tweet, so take a look at this. It's um, uh, what he suggested is if you use minus D Java security EGD equals file def u random, it will sp speed up the startup time of your application servers. And um, I, on my docklands, there is still no image with that, but I will try it. And um, why Andy became active? I think I said something that Tommy could be, um, it's too slow or something, my screencast, which uh, is not true is Tom is actually very fast I use it a lot um, startup time is great but I think I had issues in the past once or something on, 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 on a conference and I probably said it but uh, this was this is over and uh, I had also issues with white friend Payara so it really but I don't think um, it was this I I, I, th I suspect it was more more my network that the servers waited for for the network to configure or something like this 
So sometimes it happens, and um, if you are curious, the last at the last Java one my microservice talk, it wo it went completely south. The uh, the Glassfish or or I think I use Glassfish was um, extremely slow. So no one knows why, but it happens um, at the last Java one to me. So but it was not Tommy. Okay. Um, so uh, this is interesting. So uh, actually, people from uh, Nigerian uh, interbank settlement system registered to the AHEX. And they are very eager, but they registered two months ago for the uh, workshop in December. And um, so what usually happens, so what you have to know is, if you register to the AHEX.com, you get an ID. What it basically means is, uh, I get an email and I know there's somewhere there. So, uh, and we know how many how many attendees already uh, are. So we book the rooms and we try, or this is actually wrong. We always get the largest possible room of the, uh, of the um, airport Munich. And sometimes we have fight with other companies for the room. For instance, in the current uh, air hacks, uh, there was also BMW at uh, airport Munich and they got the largest room. So we got the one smaller, but I know uh, it is really hard to fight with BMW. But um, so, and um, and they uh, the people from Nigeria are a little bit afraid that uh, the, um, the the I didn't got the uh, registration I got the registration and you are registered and you get the invoice but um, um, I mean this the, the whole airhex dot com um, I only did it because I got lots of requests about Java E workshops and I, isn't it possible to me to travel around the, the world and deliver the same workshop 200 times? So what I do instead, I do it uh, a few times at airport Munich and everyone is happy. It's a nice location, nice coffee, and people come to Munich and uh, yeah, we do it. So you are registered, Taisei, so yeah, welcome to Munich. And, um, and I will send you the invoice. Um, and come to December and you will see a great December. Usually we have a Christmas market, which is great. So people from USA really like it because of the glowing wine. So, and having that said, lots of people registered. There was registration from Azerbaijan and I forgot. And they wanted to have an uh, invitation from me, which I wrote, but it never went through. So somehow uh, if, you, if you need a visa to come to Munich, I'm not possible to, it's impossible to me to help you. So it never worked and uh, I, I probably, it costs a lot of time and never works. So I will just don't do this. What we could do instead, uh, of course, private uh, um, um, air hacks. So if you are in a foreign country, so we can do it via WebEx. This is what usually works. So you don't have to, to know to travel three days to visit a Java E workshop at Munich Airport. Okay, so thank you and see you in December. Um, so um, Sim Devmon said, I'm developing Java 7 in Angular application, which is interesting. So um, if you like to be interviewed, ping me. With uh, JaxOS and JWT JSON Web Token, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering JaxOS and plus JWT, whether you should be not JSON because I mean, just JWT. But it's okay, uh, JSON Web Token. The other 10% are long running tasks where progress titles should be visible in the front end. So what he needs then, push. For this, I can th uh, think in uh, the two possible solutions. So the one is the poll status from JaxRS, which is, which is long polling or comet, works perfectly. You can use the suspended async response for that, or WebSockets to push status. And, and, and uh, what you could also use is HTTP2 uh, soon. Um, and why that? Um, this this WebSocket to push status, um, this would be the best. The problem, of course, this is not more complex. It's actually easier, this WebSocket to push. It has to be supported by your environment. It could be that uh, you know, firewall or, or a proxy server does not support WebSockets and then you know, you are set, uh, or it's game over. So the fallback is always JaxOS. So if you can use WebSocket, just use them. They are very simple from JavaScript as well as from backend. And I think even there is a screencast I record is really, I think even simpler than long polling with JaxOS. The problem with JaxOS long polling, messages can go lost because um, from the client, uh, you have to, 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 to acquire a connection and the server blocks the connection. If the co uh, and, and if nothing happens, the client has to reacquire the connection and the server will just uh, send back 204, no, uh, no data, the client will reacquire the connection. And in this particular time, 
messages could get lost. So there is a small window where it could get lost. With WebSockets, it's a more robust technology. Um, which way to go? If you can, use WebSockets. They are very simple from Java 7 and Ang Angular. I mean, Angular, there's this let socket equals new WebSocket. Socket dot, uh, send, send. this is the JavaScript method for send. And on message, lowercase is the, uh, is the event listener, JavaScript event listener for WebSockets. It's very simple. Yes, uh, recommendations, uh, I, I, I do it a lot uh, with, uh, with WebSockets and JaxRes. And if I know that, uh, you know, we have in an in, in, in undefined environment, I just go with JaxRes long polling, otherwise um, use WebSockets. By the way, we implemented both in the recent effective uh, last week at Airport Munich uh, uh, at the same time, I use CDI event and pushed um, an event using JaxRS and WebSockets at the same time. Okay, so this is what you can do. And um, okay, next one. Um, there's a blog post and what I did in the blog post, I, sh I, I, we can take a look at this. I demonstrated, it was actually an, 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 an question uh, from one of my clients and I just um, answered with a blog post. And um, what you see here is uh, there's, there's an entity from the BCE and the entity knows how to uh, deserialize and serialize itself. So this is the whole trick to JSON object. And, um, and um, the question is what happens if you have inheritance? So this is the uh, question. So how to deal with, uh, with uh, inheritance? Um, and so, and the problem is, of course, uh, if you have JSON object, it is a little bit hard because uh, it's immutable. So you cannot just um, add new attributes to it. So we'll have to copy to another JSON object. What I also did in the past, um, um, it is going to be bet better in Java 8. So uh, it is uh, easier to, uh, to, to uh, extend JSON object. Um, in this particular case, you can of course use JSON object builder. So instead of returning JSON object, you can turn JSON object builder, and then the uh, JAXRS resource we only have to invoke dot build. So if you have inheritance hierarchy, just use JSON object builder. Good idea. Um, so uh, Jay Ibarra has several questions. So I hope this is clear. So JSON object builder you can use equally well. You don't have to expose JSON object. JSON object is is more like a sealed hash map, you cannot add attributes anymore. Um, so um, Jay Ibarra is interested in the course of Java microservices. Uh, so uh, whether I use Jenkins, absolutely. So uh, use Jenkins 2.0 with uh, pipeline as, as, as code um, and uh, all my microservices are deployed with Jenkins 2.0, so it works well. And if I buy the course, can I ask you specific questions about microservice if you do not cover it in the course? Absolutely, so this is what we do here. If you have questions, answer the questions uh, or ask the questions here at the, at the gist. There will be a gist for the 41st um, microservice uh, edition next month. And once a month, I answer all the questions. It's a way better approach because I don't believe or I just cannot answer the question via email or, or, or because it's not really efficient and is even worse via Twitter. So I think this works well. Okay, uh, let's see what happens here. So no questions. No questions. Cool. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I liked it. Um, I really appreciate that you like the uh, yeah hex. I actually really appreciate and really looking forward to this. No idea why, but uh, it's a very productive way to uh, to answer stuff and keep in touch with friends of the show. <laughs> so. Um, and this is the question related to the other one. So uh, I get the idea behind async request completable future suspend. When to use it, what is the use case, when to avoid it? So um, I never use it without reasons. So what could be the reasons? Long polling. So why it shines in long polling? Because the suspended, uh, um, suspended async response, what it causes that the threat is parked. What we did in the monitoring workshop we created several thousand requests, suspended requests, and there was no effect on the on the thread count. Um, this is um, this is the, the the main feature. So if you have 
longer requests and you will and and you have to block them with the sus suspended they uh, the thread is going to be parked so um it is um it has the roots i think in the grizzly http server in glassfish 2 it was one of the first servers which supports long polling without uh without blocking the thread and uh, this is very um how to call it resource efficient and um what i did at the workshop uh last week i uh wrapped the uh async response in a cdi event send it to uh, broadcast it within the thin war and um and there were someone asked me to implement a batch job in the in the workshop as an, 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 an example of batch job and uh, what i did i pushed the status of the batch job batch job using this so the event arrived and if the batch job had something to say it used the event and pushed the data back so this was actually this second question experience with docker swarm yes i have um any tips or avoid it so uh mixed feelings so uh, docker is the i would say is the originator of the uh, containerization hype and uh, docker is almost like a standard so rocket is of course the uh, standard there is not not ro rocket rather than appc is the standard but i mean docker is the everywhere and they have some paid services like docker swarm and usually what what i try to do is if i start with java se and, ja and i cannot find apis i go further with java e because java e why because everything is java right so i try to stick with the standard and the same is in docker so i will start with docker and uh, if the docker community edition is not enough which is called moby by the way right now i would extend to enterprise docker to docker swarm having said that um, there's another almost standard for 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 orchestration of of docker and this is kubernetes so uh, in my eyes kubernetes gains crazy momentum so um openshift and red hat is based on kubernetes kubernetes in the clouds and what kubernetes is kubernetes uh, manages uh, docker containers so um i would consider kubernetes or docker swarm and i think kubernetes has more momentum than docker swarm but evaluate both okay and this interesting so um questions no questions Oh, Mr. Tucker is here. Cool. So we have uh, another channel at the free node. So uh, uh, there, Monsieur Tucker, who is from, um, I think Arizona, is the, uh, the guy from uh, who really like the Christmas market, and uh, Pavel Pscheidel. This is the uh, we met at the Oracle Code as well in Prague. Okay. Now, questions? No questions so lazy chat and um, so imdvr said okay they used egb annotation and what happens wi-fi tend to start too many threads of egbs and this is suspicious i don't think there is any any correlation between threads and egb annotation so um egb by per default runs in the caller thread um Possibly you have at asynchronous. This could explain it. But if, if there is no asynchronous annotations, you have you should have the same amount of of uh, EGBs. Um, so I never observed the behavior. It is really strange. So uh, there should be no. If you remove the EGB annotation, should have the the same amount of threads. What I would do, I would connect with J Visual VM uh, locally and try to find out what is the name of the thread, and then you know try to to see where the threat comes from. So this is really interesting behavior. So um, I didn't observe that. And if you go to the, I think, uh, testing and microservice workshop is ehex.io, it's the, it's the online paid version, commercial version. I also did several uh, um, uh, threats observation with JVisual VM and there was nothing strange. So we, we performed some stress tests, for instance, live and uh, everything was EGB. So you, you could watch it even live. So, and there is an interesting, so, next one. Syed G. Um, there's an interesting, very formal article on InfoQ. Uh, why I no longer use MVC frameworks? And um, it explains a, um, 
a very formally uh, what what React does, how HTML5 looks like, and there is an and there is a uh, uh, a SAM principle called uh, state actions and model, which in my eyes is very similar to uh, to MVC, and uh, then say okay he doesn't like MVC frameworks anymore, and uh, the new stuff is SAM and TLA plus, which I forgot, this TLA plus, temporal logic of actions. Um, and this is very functional way of implement uh, JavaScript, um, JavaScript applications. And um, whether I think that MVC is dying. I mean, MVC was, is declared dead for a long time. And the successor was MVP, which is, which is also dead, and model view presenter by uh if you go to Fowler as you can see in 2006 model view presenter was also retired and he split it in uh, passive view and supervising controller and um and I don't think this is that at all so to give you some examples I have a um I implement or I'm also maintaining a a framework and this framework is called Afterburner, and has nothing to do with uh, with JavaScript. It is a JavaFX framework, but for unknown reasons, it is very popular. And uh, on the road, uh, it is also interesting. So I was uh, on the way to uh, DevOps PL. By the way, DevOps. I forgot to mention the DevOps PL conference. Great sold sold out conference in uh, in Krakow. And um, what I did there, I presented, uh, I built a small Java 7 thin wall microservice, but I just spent uh, probably five to 10 minutes and then implemented HTML5 app uh, and, and, and try to show, you know, that you can also, what happens if you apply the Java stick way of, uh, of backing, back end thinking to the front end. This was actually the idea. But, but the, the nice story is I met some Airhex attendees and I mentioned the DevOps PL somewhere conferences and they just attended the conference. So um, there was uh, another Airhex attendee, Victor, and he uh, I met him in, uh, in, in in Krakow and I said, hey, do you mentioned uh, DevOps? And now we are here and this is a nice conference and it was really nice. But there were people from, uh, from, from airplane manufacturer who are using the afterburner and which basically is MVP framework i mean there are three classes and they were, were they were really happy with it so i asked them that they had some to perform some ra rather computations or calculations and they say yeah it's it, it, it's simple it works and and, and it's very productive so um and this is a feedback we did it in swing and and and, and javax and what what happened right now i do the same in html5 so in html5 without any additional framework i have uh, usually a class called let's say um there's no name for it. I call it still presenter. I actually use exact, exactly the same naming as in Afterburner FX because it works worked well with Java FX. Probably uh, I could even create Afterburner.js, but still there is nothing. I mean, probably one class, one JavaScript class. And um, I have one one uh, presenter. Then sometimes a model and sometimes a service. So what a service does, it just wraps fetch or XHR. This is XML HTTP request. I usually use fetch in modern applications. It's just functions, which are, by the way, in JavaScript, you get something like a future back or completable future, which is called promise. It's fully asynchronous. Model is uh, the state, if you have some state between views. And the presenter just is the binding between the HTML with document query selector and the backend. And this would be MVC or MVP in my eyes, uh, exactly what Afterburner is. Um, so I don't think it's that. Uh, and um, and if something works for you and you are productive, and it sounds sounds easy and new developers like it, this is actually the point. If you're on a project and you get fresh developers and they like it right away, say okay, this is easy, let's go. Then just use it so that it will not die. From the, uh, of course, if you have a pure functional point of view, um, this MVC might makes lesser sense because the state is involved in the model, which is from the functional point of view, pure functional point of view, not that good. Okay. Long story. So we have that. 
So, uh, where is our slide? Again, we lost the tab. And whether I use reactive programming, I think the uh, completable future is almost reactive. But um, what uh, what reactive would mean? I have source of events. I can subscribe to the source of events, and this would be like a future, which is where I can is a future where I could constantly subscribe to events. So in, in Java 8, if I have completable future or future, I, I get the result and then I would have, would have to call the method again. The only difference to reactive programming is um, that I won't have to resubscribe. I would get the events over and over again. And then I could do interesting things like filter, map the events, and so forth. Um, so in that sense, I use it. What I don't do it, I don't use additional libraries. So I try to stick with uh, Java E and Java 8. And uh, and and the and the use cases, um, what you will have to do is like event source. So you get some, of course, you know, the, the stock ticket. Uh, stock ticker would be the best. Something like this. Uh, you have an uh, uh, event of, of, of data, a source of data, and you can subscribe to it. Um, it could be, of course, um, if, if, you, if you take it to the extreme, could be a mouse is also a source of event, right? Because if you, if you do with the mouse pointer something, it just emits events. So you can subscribe to them and, uh, and uh, do something interesting with it. And I think if you... There should be an old screencast about reactive programming in Java X. Four years old. Take a look at this. Um, this is truly reactive in Java VIX and Java 8. What I did then is, I, I guess, I implemented uh, validation, input validation in the reactive way. Um, how? Um, what you can do, you can, uh, I, I forgot actually what I did, but you can say, uh, when name is not null, text field name is not null, and uh, or first name not null, and last name dot, dot, dot not null, then uh, um, send button enabled. So whatever you do, the uh, send button listens to the events of the both text fields and it gets automatically enabled or disabled. So for input validation, reactive is really nice. And uh, I did it in JavaScript, do it all the time without thinking about this. But it's not like, you know, uh, I have to think, should I use reactive right now? It just happens. Okay. Which of Java technologies should one learn for creating microservices with Java? Uh, I would say uh, JaxRS for sure. You don't have to use EGBs, just the first class, which is called from JaxRS annotate with stateless. Um, and you have to know at inject. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think you have to learn a lot to, to implement uh, microservices with Java, uh, with um, Java E. What do you what you should learn is to delete as much code as possible. So it's not like you think you have to, you know, to learn something and then put 200 annotations on one shopping cart. Uh, Pojo, the reverse is true. If if uh, your Java e microservice should contain as much as possible business logic and as few as possible Java e annotations. And this is a nice question. Um, is it possible to pro programmatically deploy, in a, enable, disable, undeploy a Java e app on GlassFish? Uh, of course not. <laughs> no, it's absolutely possible. And actually, uh, it is a um, project which I implemented. And uh, hopefully, loader, yes, with a screencast. And even, I forgot it, webhooks. So it even implemented uh, webhooks and what the loader does two years ago, no, four years ago, or two years ago. Um, it is exactly what you wanted. It uses Payara and Glassfish REST API to deploy, undeploy, enable, and disable apps. And I use it for continuous integration with Jenkins, which also answers the other question, whether I use Jenkins in microservices. 
And um, what's interesting, if you look at the source code, so this is just an application, deployer, you will see that it uses the JAXRS API from Glassfish. And uh, the hooker, you can register as a, um, it will call you back. So this is the, the idea here, so three classes. And the same is true for JBoss. So if you go to JBoss CLI deploy, you could do it exactly the same with Whitefly. So uh, deploying from command line with Whitefly. So I implemented the alternative with Whitefly and you can absolutely compare it, it's comparable with Glassfish. So you can um, easily extend loader to, to work with Whitefly. Of course, um, WebSphere and WebLogic, uh, they have not only um, Jamix, they have, uh, uh, this uh, WebSphere comes with uh, Jython and, um, uh, and WebLogic comes with w WST. This is WebLogic scripting tool. Um, so uh, all these servers, I'm not sure whether there is a command line interface for Tommy. So uh, this is not sure about, but all other application servers comes with uh, REST API and you can fully automate this. Um, yeah, and, and I'm not using, G very nice, GS GSR88 is an old deployment um, API. And this is what I'm lacking in Java, e, uh, missing in Java E8 and Java E9. But it uh, seems like the developers are not very interested in deployment and monitoring. So I tried to suggest that I was in the Java one, uh, was it three years ago? It was like, you know, um, brainstorming what is could be interesting, interested, interesting in Java EE back then seven, I think. And I proposed that, but the community didn't vote for this for deployment. No one is interested in deployment. They're more interested about implementation features. In my eyes, it would be nice to have, you know, a more standardized monitoring in Java E and deployment. This would be really nice to automate better the application servers. So, but okay. When working with microservices, what do you use to control the amount of simultaneous access to, to a service? Great question built in. So the simplest possible is at stateless and max pool size. So it works for ages. This is a built in denial of service attack preventer and uh, more sophisticated cases use something like porcupine, what I showed already. So you can configure, configure uh, individually um, thread pools and so have you know, uh, the limited amount of threads per, per service. And uh, so this is built in bulkheads. And, uh, or you can just inject managed, execu managed execution service. And this managed execution service is, um, is a simplified version of Porcupine. The only difference is you will have to configure it on the, in the application server console or an XML file. In Porcupine, you can do it on the on, on the fly. How do you do the load balance? These are perfect questions today. So with Nginx or HIProxy, look at my Docklands repositories so first. Adam Bean, microservice uh, HIProxy. Load balancing Java microservices. This is a nice screencast, probably five to 10 minutes, where I implement it on the fly. You see minus minus net load balancing. So there's a load balance framework. So you can look at this. And I guess I also did it in the microservice workshop. So take a look at that. Can you comment a, a good read on how to build applications with microservice? Uh, no idea. So I, I recorded the microservice uh, workshop. It's online. Micros this is AirHex.io. Hex.io. There are the various microservice um, workshops, uh, microservices, or Java EE micro dot services, I guess. Yes. So this is the workshop. So we can rent it for nine euros or buy it for 36, 36 euros, but there is no upgrade. Um, for other reasons, this is a Vimeo. This is impossible. So if you rent it, you cannot just buy it afterwards. You can, but you have to pay twice. So there is no, no f standard way to do this. One of the most asked questions. 
Um, and I don't know. So if you know a book about a, a pragmatic book about microservice, I don't know. I don't. Know. I don't think there is a Java e microservice book right now. Um, yeah. But what you should you do? Rewatch our Airhex TV. There's, uh, I think, in each episode there is something about microservices. So take a look. No new questions. This was the last one eight hours ago. So uh, no questions. Utah. So Betakis, Utah, Arizona. Sorry. Uh, no questions here. Two questions here. WST WebLogic scripting tool and not WST. Absolutely. So Daniel is the expert. So um, as you can see, if you have questions about WST, just ping Daniel. Daniel will help you. Right? Okay. Thank you for watching. See you in October or December. Let's take a look. October and December. Hopefully, I'll, um, uh, I don't think the invitations for the Java 1 talks are out, but um, I, I have no idea whether I would talk at Java 1 or not. If yes, see you at Java 1. Hopefully DevOps Antwerpen. Uh, there will be I will probably be also in DevOps at uh, Vox Day in Romania if it works out, and hopefully in WJAX in Munich. So um, yeah, I missed the CFP, but uh, hopefully I will make it. Thank you for watching. See you in October, December. Or classic air hacks or bootstrap effective and probably architecture is going to be I guess March or April in 2018. Thank you for watching and see you in August. Yeah, August online. Bye.